All right, Michelle, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing? I'm doing really good. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. We debated uh, lengthly through uh, Instagram DMs whether we would do this one in French or in English, and we decided, hey, we'll start in English, and then at some, we'll, we'll do the follow-up interview in uh, in French. That way, everybody can you know get a piece of the pie. So yeah. I think that's that'll work out pretty good, right? Yeah, the beauty of bilingualism. Exactly, and uh, now is also the beauty of subtitles on YouTube, so people can actually appreciate no matter what language they speak. That's true. <laughs> that is very true technology hey it's sometimes it's good when it when it works it's good it's it's yes it's better that way 100 uh, michelle for the three listeners who don't know who you are could you give us a, a quick intro who are you and what do you do um my name is michelle Letton. uh i'm from montreal quebec i am a i'm the creator of deca comp um, so what I do is kind of, I oversee DECA comp. We have, a, we have programming for individual athletes. We also do programming for affiliates, CrossFit affiliates or functional fitness, fitness gyms. And, uh, I also coach, um, Patrick Vellner, uh, Freya Moosberger at the moment. And in the past I've coached other games athletes. Some of them have done really well, finished on the podium. Um, so yeah, that's kind of very, very short resume. Um, before coaching, I was a CrossFit Games athlete from 2011 to 2016. And so if I even go back further, I started my CrossFit kind of journey in 20, 2009, end of 2009. Before that, I played water polo. That was my main sport. I had aspirations of be, being on the Olympic team. Uh, that didn't um, happen, but it gave me um, a good um, background for for CrossFit, so to speak, even though I didn't know it back then. Uh, things happen for a reason, I should say. And uh, aside from aside from that athletic background, I have a degree in design art. So I actually studied in fine arts and design. And that's kind of me in a nutshell, really, or what I've done, I should say, what I've done in a nutshell. So, so far, the story is not. Over. Yeah, so far, <laughs> still young. <laughs> you said, uh, I want to come back to your CrossFit story first. You said that, you know, what you, you your previous sporting endeavors uh, had a good carryover into your, your CrossFit, uh, your CrossFit career. So talk to us about this. What did you feel helped you from your uh, water polo past into CrossFit? Was it the training? Um, what, what, what specifically helped you the most? Well, specifically, if I'm really thinking about physical attributes and, and qualities, I uh, on top of water polo, I, I swam also. So I swam com pet mm. competitively for three years and then went into water polo. So um, specifically, like physically, I've gotten very flexible yet strong shoulders. So that's a big one up especially as a female athlete my pole was very very strong yeah um my push was okay but i had a really strong pull and um uh, i had the stamina to sustain a lot of upper body uh muscle endurance kind of uh, challenges um if we talk maybe a little bit more like metabolically water polo is like a very stop and go sport we don't think of it that way but there's a lot of change in directions and you have to be very dynamic because the change in directions will require a really aggressive whip kick. So, and we think of all the treading and everything. So I did have a good dynamic um, lower body. I think my stature also helps with that. Like I'm five foot one. So the reason I wasn't very, I didn't go very far in water polo is probably one of the reasons why I was very successful in CrossFit. <laughs> um, but aerobically also it's, it's like, um, it's a very, a demanding sport aerobic, aerobically so that had a good carryover that said where it doesn't have a good carryover in water polo is that we didn't do a lot of land training when mm -hmm. I was young so back then you know strength work uh, strength and conditioning wasn't super present even though I was I would consider at a pretty high level um, I think that now things have changed but back then our dry land training was like holding a plank, you know, typical swimming dry land training where you're like holding, it's very isometric and very, very basic. So um, mentally though, if I look at um, how water polo has gotten me, me ready for CrossFit, I think because of the challenges I faced when I was playing water polo, my stature, um, my lack of reach, you know, mm -hmm. um, it 
made me work much, much, much harder to get what I wanted. So I was, and, and this, the sport gave me this um, opportunity, but that discipline comes from my family. My father is a very disciplined, hardworking person. So is my mother, but water polo gave me an outlet to kind of explore that discipline. So, you know, an hour before practice, I was there an hour after practice, I was there. I would also ask my coach if it was okay, if I can practice with the boys sometimes. So that work ethic 100% carries over to CrossFit. And so that, that gave me a really good, a very, very good, strong background. Um, to when I found CrossFit, which was like literally like maybe three or four years after I stopped playing water polo. Yeah, so, so it took some time in between, but yeah. It's interesting. A uh, common trait with Guillaume Brion, the French CrossFitter who went to the games this year. Yeah, I met him also, this summer. Right. So also uh, uh, ex swimmer. And same thing, you know, upper body volume is not an issue for him. So yeah. it's it's interesting to see the past of uh, of the top athletes and see what you know what they did in usually in high volume for for those different sports, right? In their past for many years, and how yeah. that has a, a direct impact on uh, on the the sport of CrossFit. A hundred percent, and that's why I think that's a really good reason why certain people doubt some athletes that really began their athletic career in CrossFit. Um, and, and so like, we're kind of, we're going to see in a few years what that, like how that translates into the longevity of CrossFit athletes and, and their careers and their, like, let's say their strengths, because CrossFit is really good at kind of uh, equalizing the strengths and weaknesses. Like we, we, we're exposed to both all the time. If you do CrossFit, very well you'll be exposed to those weaknesses um but in a sports setting it's good to have strengths so like it, it'll like it's anyway it's very interesting you're right like when you people a lot of people say that they wish they had a gymnastics background which a lot of people thought I had <laughs> because of my stature like oh yeah she's a girl she's five foot one for sure she did gymnastics she's got a good upper body but actually and I, I did gymnastics one I tried I think two like sessions and I told my mother I hated it so I never went back but like um yeah it's 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 um I think that gymnastics is a good example of like everyone wishes they were they had gymnastics as a background for CrossFit but to be honest with you I think field sports and uh, aquatic sports have way more carryover than we think aquatic sports has a lot of carryover aerobically um but gymnastics is more of a skill thing and as we're progressing in the sport, we're starting to see that I'm going to take this year, ex I'm going to exclude this year because there was a big change in programming when we look at the CrossFit Games. But in the past years, like athletes who had field experience, aerobic experience, running experience, um, they had a really big advantage compared to athletes that had more of a skilled uh, experience background. Yeah, I guess, like you said, everything at the end of the day is predicated on what the workout on the board is going to be to some extent. Uh, but yeah. it's undeniable that to excel at the elite level in CrossFit, you need uh, an outstanding work capacity. And like you said, having a past in those different, you know, more uh, aerobic or endurance based uh, events is going to have that is going to bring you those abilities. You're, you're going to have developed those qualities over many years. And so yeah. when you transition into the sport, you, you have the foundation to layer up all the work that's necessary to then perform. Yeah, 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 for sure. How did your, how would you summarize or how would you talk us through your CrossFit career uh, when you look back on it now as uh, as a coach, as someone who works with, you know, CrossFit athletes uh, in the space now, uh, what memories do you have or what souvenirs oh, do you man. have of your, of your CrossFit career? That's a really loaded question because today as a coach, um, I appreciate my career more than I did as an athlete. Obviously, I think that th that kind of goes without saying for a lot of athletes, but like as a coach today, I face a lot of difficulties with my physical stature, uh, with my mental limitations, uh, my emotional limitations, um, my desire to like, I didn't have the same will to sacrifice as some other athletes that perform better. And I understand that now. And I see that as an advantage today. So that, that has made me extremely aware of what it takes to win and what it takes to be good and, you know, stuff like that. 
Um, I, I, what I, what I remember and appreciate the most out of my career is that um, I was able to find a sport that catered to who I am as a person. And so I really love to discover, I'm a process driven person. I love practice. I love learning. I'm not the biggest fan of training and I'm not the biggest fan of winning. Um, and so CrossFit gave me this opportunity to learn from so many different fields, so many different people, um, just all kinds of things. I can't even begin to explain the things that I've kind of learned over the years. Some of them I've forgotten probably, but it's just, there's so much stuff. And it's like, if you're in any way, shape or form, uh, amateur of, of the a learning process kind of thing, that CrossFit is a hundred percent the sport for you. Um, you know, so I've had some amazing coaches. I've had some not so great coaches. I've, I've got to see like, I've had the opportunity to train with Matt Fraser, you know, and I've got to see what that looked like from the very beginning, from before he was even an, a games athlete to today. So there's like, there's so many things. And then I've got to travel. I've got to, you know, so many things that don't involve the actual sport that are really the fondest memories that I have. Um, but as an athlete, I've got to experience what it means to win on the biggest stage of our sport. Like I've won uh, two or three events. Uh, I think I won two events, um, not very many, but I've gotten to see that. And I've also came second to last. So I've gone through all kinds of emotional things, you know? So that to me is the, the biggest thing is just, I am the coach and the person I am today because I was able to do that. Um, yeah. So it's, it's a big memory. It's like a big thing, but I wouldn't, I, I don't think I would change knowing who I am today and what I do and what I want out of life, I don't think I would be okay with, with a podium contending career versus the career that I've had. So plus, I mean, as a person, I realized very kind of quickly that being a professional athlete wasn't for me. Like I loved riding the train, the wave of doing it, like it was cool, but that lifestyle just it's not for me, but I know what it's about. So as a coach, I understand what the requirements are and everything like that. Did you have the same perspective on your career um, shortly after you stopped competing uh, as an elite CrossFitter or did that no, mature over time? I, I knew, so there are, there are some pivotal moments in my career that I can, that I thought I wanted to win. Um, and I thought I wanted that out of my life. And that was like at the end of 2014, where I ranked fourth. Um, on the moment, I ranked fourth. And that was like, oh, my goodness, I can actually make the podium. I can. I was six points away from the podium. And so I was like, I can do this. This is what I want, you know. And I remember having a conversation with Josh Bridges in the back end of this competition um, where we were waiting to get tested. And Josh was like man, uh, fourth is the worst. And I remember him saying that to me and he, it wasn't bad intentions at all. I knew what he meant, but I had been so over the moon excited about finishing fourth, not realizing what I had missed out on financially because I never did it for the money and what it meant for my career as a sponsored athlete, all that things. But I was so not thinking about that, that when he said that to me, I was like, oh, shoot, maybe I should be disappointed because I should be wanting to win and I should want to, you know, so that was kind of like a seed that was planted. And then after that conversation and after that year, I said to myself, Michelle, you are in it to win it. You should want to win the games. And so 2015 um, was a year that my intentions were to win the games and everything I did throughout the year was for that. And it was probably one of the most difficult years in training and you console yourself that you're like, you're doing it to win it. You're doing it to win it, you know? And, and then 2015 was probably the worst CrossFit games experience that I've ever had in my life. Um, we had the Murph in, in midday. Every one of us had like a heat stroke or a heat injury. And uh, it was undiagnosed for me. Like after the first day I was fifth in the rankings. And then the next day I couldn't even jump. So I remember we had an event that morning on the Saturday morning where we had to like jump hurdles. Mm. 
And in practice, I hit every single hurdle to the point where even one hurdle, I, I, I missed the mark so much that I actually hit my knee in the middle of the hurdle and fell right on my face. And I was like, I remember my boyfriend's face back then. He was like, whoa, this is not going to go well. And so feeling that embarrassment of just knowing that my my competition was kind of over because I could physically not do anything. I was out of it. I had nothing left and it was Saturday morning. And so that was a very tough conversation, a very tough competition. You know, I kind of just dragged my feet through. And one of the worst things after that event, after that weekend was like, I had a conversation with my coach and he told me that he felt like I wasn't even trying. And so I realized that I was like, oh my goodness, maybe I am not trying. But at the same time now I'm like, yeah, I had nothing. I had nothing. If you would have asked me to do the strength tests, like I would have barely like been able to close my hands. Yeah. So it was a really bad experience. And then the turning point there was like, I was going to stop right there. And then I realized I'm like, you know, for me, sacrificing everything for this isn't worth it. For some, it is a hundred percent worth it. And for me, it wasn't. So I realized then and there, I'm like, nope, this is not for me. Like, even though I feel like physically I can probably continue on, I decided that 2016 was going to be my last year. And so those are the, the two turning points where I discovered a lot about myself. Um, I wouldn't change that for a second, but like, yeah. So, so that, that, like when I retired, I was a little bit frustrated with the fact that I, I was like, not a winner. I never finished on the podium and I wasn't even a consistent top 10. I got a top 10 once. Mm -hmm. People think that I got it more often, but I was really good at regionals, but I wasn't good at the game. So I was disappointed with that. And I had a sour taste in my mouth and kind of like a, an athletes will probably not say this out loud, but I felt really ashamed that I wasn't able to have that kind of career. And then today I think about it and it really has allowed me to learn a lot. So, you know, to answer your question, no, I didn't have that kind of mindset when I was freshly retired. I was disappointed that I wasn't the best in the sport. Um, but today, after many years, I don't know, six, seven years, it means nothing. Because honestly, if I had gotten many top tens, I don't think people would have remembered me for that more than they remember me now, you know? So it's, to me, it meant today it means very little. When you retired from your competitive career, did you know you were going to stay in the CrossFit space and that's what you wanted to do moving forward? 100%. Or did you have other ideas? A hundred percent. Like I said, one of the, one of the key things that I was exposed to throughout my career is amazing coaching and amazing coaching made me want to be an amazing coach. And then the not so good coaching, the not so great approaches, the one size fits all approaches was like, no, this is unacceptable and athletes can't be exposed to that all the time. Um, so I knew I wanted to coach. Uh, when I started CrossFit, I actually started CrossFit at a gym as a secretary. And then I, I started to do CrossFit because they're like, you have to do CrossFit if you're going to be the secretary of a CrossFit gym. And I'm like, okay, I'll start. Um, I had not done CrossFit before. And so I fell in love with that. But then on top of that, when I watched the coaches, I was like, man, that's really cool. I would love to do that. And so I got my level one and I started coaching CrossFit. And I realized that I really, really love teaching. I really love coaching CrossFit. So all throughout my competitive career, I always kept a job as a coach. And um, when I took my level two I was like, oh yeah, I really want to do this. And then, so I applied to be on the level one seminar staff. So coaching had always been something that I was really passionate about. And I never really thought of it as a career um, until 2015, when I was very disappointed in the coach that I was working with. I was kind of disappointed in the previous coach that I worked in with. And I was like, I'm like, it's not human. It's, I'm a very difficult athlete to coach because I'm very opinionated. And so I felt like I didn't have a coach that knew how to deal with me. And I am like, man, I, I think I can do this. So when I did the, there was one competition back then CrossFit games had these invitational competitions and I was invited to be the coach of one of those competitions. And I believe it was in Madrid. 
And when I went there and experienced what it was to be a coach, I was like, oh man, yeah, this is, I totally want to do this. And so when I retired, like knowing 2016 was going to be my last year, I started working on Deca Comp. Um, and so I knew that I was going to get into the space. 2016 was the first year Patrick Vellner competed as an individual, mm -hmm. my last, and he was like in transition. Um, he was going to go to Toronto to finish his schooling. And in the summer of that season, 2016, he, his apartment was up. So me and my boyfriend invited him to stay with us. We had a big house with space for it. Mm -hmm. And so he, Pat stayed with us and we trained together 2016 and, you know, getting to know Pat and feeling like we reached to a really solid relationship. A little later on when I, st after the games 2016, I kind of like asked him if he wanted to work with me as a coach. And, and so he agreed to it. And then as I worked with Pat, which is silly because Pat was already a podium finisher and I was like, I took on a really, really big risk, not realizing it because I was a complete newbie and it worked out really well. And I realized very quickly that I think I could do this and I was good at it and it was tough, but I think I could do it. And Pat being very opinionated like myself, like I got exposed to a very tough character to coach from the beginning. So I felt like I was in a good position to continue the on as like that as a career. And from your standpoint today, with all your experience, what are the qualities required to be a good or, as you said, an amazing coach? Yeah, I think the biggest quality is, you know, you have to, coaching is a people first job. It's like the epitome of HR, right? Human relations. It's like any anyone who, honestly, the only job that I can think of, and I call it a job, the only thing that I can think of that is more demanding on terms of, in terms of human relationships is being a parent. Um, and then coaching is very close second because, you know, in a job, when you're a boss to an, to an employee, there's a nine to five and there's a, I'm a, I'm your boss here. And then when the job is done, I'm not your boss anymore. When you're coaching, it's always, you're always in relation with that person. Whatever you say is, is it can impact someone you, you might not even realize that there are some things that my coaches have said to me that have, have have affected me and created my career and and sometimes it's not in the best way you know when I when I said that I was really disappointing in the coaching that I got like that's a big reason why I'm doing this today because I'm like like people have to be more aware that people like athletes are human and they have emotions and some athletes aren't like crazy obsessed and they don't have the you know quote unquote champion mindset kind of thing ingrained in them. Some of them are just people that are really talented that need to, that need to have guidance. So that to me is a really, really important quality. Like what's the most important? I don't think there is a most important because for one athlete, the most important quality is knowledge. And for another athlete, the most important quality is how they're, they're treated. And for another athlete, it's like how they're challenged. So it there there is no one answer to that and and i'm sorry viewers but i'm never gonna give a straight up answer to questions like that because it's so gray like there's no black and white um what's the only thing that's black and white is it works for you or it doesn't you know and then and then on that other flip side like if it doesn't work for you can you adapt or can you not adapt you know what i mean so to me as an athlete the most important quality would have been someone that cared about how I felt. You know, I'm like, I'm a disciplined person. Like I said, in water polo, like I will do the work and I will, I will do what's written and I will 100% um, uh, uh, be there a hundred. Like if I'm doing something, it's because I really feel like I can do it. Mm. But if you can't talk to me, like I'm a human being, like I'm a, an, an adult and I have a reasonable mind, then it doesn't work. Yeah, I think the the human relations make so much sense. It it is a it is a people business, quote unquote, right? We yes. think of you know it, it's the same as uh, you know if you're a personal trainer or whatever um, you know coaching role you take, it's with a human and it's for a human. And 
this has mm -hmm. to be considered first and foremost. Or if if not, like you said, there's going to be some some things that are missing and maybe even uh, missing so much that it's going to have a negative effect either on the relationship or 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 the athlete. Um, and I, I like that you talk about this, the importance of, you know, thinking of the fact that we work with people first and yeah. and then the, the training comes around that, right? Mm hmm. A hundred percent. Like, you know, I work with like, you know, I've worked with athletes like Patrick is a good example. Like I've worked with Pat throughout his university studies, his work, and now he's a father. Mm -hmm. So if I don't realize that, and if I don't, if I'm not like careful about those things, you know, like I can really detriment you know and myself like I said it was a really good example after the games in 2015 like I'm an honest person when I dog something I will I will 100% agree like like I'll give you an example in 2016 um they gave us Murph to do a second time you know and I told uh um, I told my boyfriend at the time and I, I straight up said like I'm not going to do this event um with the intention of doing well like I'm just going to get through it it ruined my it ruined my games last year. I'm like, this is my last year. I don't want to do anything that will not allow me to continue on with the rest of the weekend. And that is a reasonable decision that I took, knowing that because of that, I was probably not going to do as well as I could. But uh, you know, Fred, my my boyfriend, who never had the official like standing of my coach, but was my coach my entire career almost, he looked at me and he knew that that's what I needed that like like I needed that like he is so good you know he challenged me when I needed it to be and he saw when I was scared and I was shying away but that was a conversation it was uh I don't know how sans froid like cold blood conversation where it's like this event is going to be just I'm gonna do it and then that's it you know there was a lot um there was a big emotional uh load in that event for me and um I couldn't I like redemption I was like no fuck that I'm just gonna get through it and and he agreed with me and even though he might not personally have agreed with me but he agreed with me you know so that to me is showing kindness in understanding where I was at what I needed to have a, a good weekend and what my goals were for the weekend because my goals weren't to win my goals was to have an enjoyable weekend and and something that I could do my my absolute best and if that meant a top five it meant a top five and if it meant a top 20 it meant a top 20 and he knew that so he didn't argue with me and he knew that that's even though probably he was like nah like that sucks you know go to competition you do that but so that's an example of really being like I felt listened to and I was like I didn't feel any pressure externally to do anything else other than my game plan so that to me is a good example of of good coaching. What comes out here is obviously communication and, and being aligned with your coach and yeah. knowing also what your athlete is thinking, as you were just saying here with your yeah. uh, example at the, at the games in 2016, what do you set up now as means of communication or strategies with your athletes to make sure that you're always aligned with what they have in mind and, and, and vice versa? How do you optimize yeah. that aspect of things to do the best job as you can? Uh, yeah. So the first thing that I have to do when I talk to my coach, my athlete, is that I have to be aware of the bias that I have, right? Like, so I have a bias that's very, I have, I'm a process driven person. Um, I have a tendency, like many people, to somewhat be scared of having the athlete go through painful situations. And so all of these biases, I have to kind of put them aside. And so as a result, my strategy is to ask them questions. And so oftentimes the athletes knows what they have to do. And my role is just to kind of get to see where they're at. And, and I ask questions and I listen to what they tell me. Sometimes the questions are really straightforward. Like, are you scared right now? Is that why, is that is that the strategy that you're taking because you're scared right now? And sometimes it's really like, just like very practical things that I have to, we have to bounce off. So the biggest thing I would say, I would compare it to brainstorming. Mm -hmm. um, and my goal, my role in the brainstorming session is a facilitator. So that those are mainly my strategies. And I, as much as I can, I also try to 
um, as much as I can, I, I, I try to make them feel 100% comfortable with telling me the honest truth. Yeah, so getting to know was. them, yeah. Getting to know them before, like outside of the competition is, is a really important factor in the communication. And that's another difficulty as being a really good coach. Like you need your limits as well. You know, I don't want to be, um, I don't want to have an athlete that is hundred percent relying on me. They need to be like, it's a job. It's my profession is a coach. And I'm like, I want to be their friends, but I can't, like, I need some kind of limit because I've gone through so many losses when, when you give hundred percent yourself to your athletes, like it's hard to lose them after. Um, but, uh, it, so you, you need to be there, you need to be there for them and you need to be human, but you also need to set your limits. So that's really difficult. <laughs> the asking questions, I think, is is key. Uh, and I find myself doing this a lot more now than I did in the first few years that I was coaching. Uh, yeah. And it's do you, do you feel like that's maybe just a product of, um, you know, being more confident with the fact that we can't know we can't know everything as coaches. And just because totally. we are the coach uh, doesn't mean that we have all the answers. And like you said, oftentimes, the, the 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 answer comes from the athlete themselves yeah i think you, i i think you're totally right and i wouldn't expect a new coach to have that kind of mindset at first because it's like when you start a business okay if if you've ever started a business or own a gym or anything like that you think that you need to have all the answers and that's what leadership is that's what our idea our idea of leadership is it's like well, I'm the leader, so I need to know this and I'm going to educate myself as much as I possibly can so that I have the answers to everything because they're looking to me for answers. And it takes so many years of experience. It takes frustration. It takes all this process to, to come down to the fact that that's not my job, you know? And then it, it's like uh, athletes, if, you, if, if there are athletes listening to this, it's just like the process of an athlete in the games or the regionals or whatever thing eventually you stop expecting so much of yourself and then you just you just flow a little bit easier when you stop expecting so much of yourself and you just start to understand okay well my strengths are this and i'm going to put my money there and then my weakness like it's just it's totally internal it's a mindset change and so yes as a coach 100 percent. when i started um just like you i was like working with Pat and I'm like, oh my God, I'm Pat's like leader. I have to take all these decisions and everything like that. And then I, on top of that, I had to deal with the intimidation factor of being the only female like known coach. There are totally tons of other female coaches out there, but they weren't as known, you know, like, so I was like, shoot, like I have so much weight on my shoulders and my first games was really intimidating. And then as like second games was you know, a little bit more. And then, and then you realize you're like, man, like, actually I can just sit back and just ask questions. And with my experience, I can, I can just kind of give people perspective. And so that's like a really strong coaching tool. If you can give people perspective and like, like that athlete answers his or her own question, like how easy is your job now technically, but you have to go through that process. You, you, you have to go through that process. So if you're a coach and you start off not thinking that like you have to know all the answers, I think like, you know, I think that's normal. I think that's hundred percent normal. Yeah. And, and the answer is often just a question away. Uh, mm -hmm. and then, so in addition to, in addition to knowing your athlete and, you know, having this collaboration, this conversation with your, with your athlete, uh, one thing that comes across here is that you're very self-aware you know yourself quite well and this seems to be one of your your tools as well is that something that you you've worked on significantly or something that you've always had yeah i've worked on this as a result of the situations that i've put myself in it's as simple as that when you're an athlete when you start being an athlete like i was saying before you expect so much of yourself and then you go through hardships and then you if you're an a, an intelligent athlete like if you're if you really truly want to get better you have no choice but to kind of ask yourself some questions figure things out try things etc and so I became very self-aware as an athlete I believe that I was very self-aware as an athlete um 
But now today there were things that when I was an athlete, I wasn't aware about. And I know this now. So, uh, and then when I started that comp, you know, not thinking I was starting a business, I thought I was just starting a coaching thing, but actually I started a business. And then I became extremely self-aware in the last few years because of this positions that I was kind of by default in as a business owner now, mm -hmm. completely different role, completely new challenges. Um, I struggled so much as a boss. Like when I, so I used to own a gym too, and I was a terrible boss, like really bad. What do you, what and do you then, mean uh, uh, I just like, people didn't respond to me and I just didn't get it. And I like, I, I, I tried so many different things that I would normally respond to, but then I was talking with a, a group of people that just didn't have my background. And so whatever I was saying was just like freaking Chinese to them. And, and they saw me as someone that's, that was authoritative and, and, um, uh, how to say in English, like super demanding and this and that. And the reality is, is that I am like that. But then I realized, you know, if I want to have success, I have to stop acting the way I would expect people to act um, based on what, who I am and how I do things. I can't expect of others what I expect of myself. I just can't do that. And so that made me extremely aware of who I am, what makes me tick, how I do things. And then through that exposure, then I became very aware of like what, what I'm lacking in order to kind of fit in all the situations. So I am today a more self-aware person, but in 10 years, I'll probably be even more so. And there's probably going to be things that today I don't know about myself that that um, that happens. But that's the beauty of life. And that to me is the beauty of sport. You know, when you do sport, you get a, a fast track exposure to self-awareness because you put yourself in such hard situations. So I think one of the reasons why non-athletes don't get athletes is because a lot of people don't like being in tough situations and athletes literally throw themselves in tough situations but not all athletes are good at reading those situations and learning from them. Um, so that's, you know, this is why I'm saying like the process that I've gone through with the disappointments and the lack of like super crazy talent, I think is, has helped me develop into someone that is very self-aware. Um, and, you know, I don't want to like, there's something kind of wrong about saying that you're very self-aware, like, I know the things that I don't know, but yeah, credit it to the situations that um, I've gotten into either by my own decision or literally by default by owning companies and owning a gym and stuff like that. Before we talk about the CrossFit season and, and training for the CrossFit Games, can you maybe give a, a piece of advice to the athletes that are listening to us? And then on the other side, the, the coaches listening to us about uh, how they can, what they can maybe do, put in place to uh, develop that self-awareness. Uh, yeah. That, yeah. I think athletes and coaches, the advice is the same and you just have to be a sponge. You have to have open pores, you know, like I think one thing that my biggest regret now that we're talking about it and I'm thinking about it is that when I was an athlete, I was quite closed minded and I thought I had all the right answers. And there's a lot of things that I think I could have done better if I had been slightly more, just open-minded, but that open-mindedness comes from just being tired of banging my head on the wall. So I think the advice is also understanding that being open-minded, it, it just, it doesn't happen just like that. Like I'm going to compare it to something that's kind of funny. It's like a smoker, you know, you can't convince a smoker to stop smoking. The smoker has to decide to stop smoking. Mm -hmm. And then, so when you decide to be open-minded because you truly are sick of it, you're sick of, of doing things that don't work um, and, and you feel caught and frustrated constantly, then probably you're going to end up being open-minded and, and, and ready to take on the world of like learning and stuff like that. So it's like, you know, be a sponge and when that moment happens with you, you'll think about what, what I just said and you'll be like, okay, this is the moment. This is it. I finally reached the point where it's like, I've tried everything. Now I just need to try to open up a little bit more. 
I hope everybody wrote down the the sponge analogy because it's <laughs> it's a great one. It's a really good one. <laughs> Let's talk about training for the CrossFit Games, uh, Michelle. Yeah. So, as a coach today, with all the experience that you've had, both both as an athlete and and now coaching people through that process, how do you um, structure the year from the end of a CrossFit Games? Compet competition all the way to the following CrossFit Games. Uh, first of all, in your mind, in the big macro kind of picture, and yeah. then we can dive into some of the details down the line. Yeah. So, um, depend. It you know the CrossFit Games season is different for everybody. Mm -hmm. Like Patrick is the example where his CrossFit Games season is almost year round, and so there's not a whole lot of opportunity for uh, huge like down like re re like relaxed time and whatever um so his season I use the conjugate system a lot with Patrick in the sense that we don't do so much linear progression so there's going to be consistent training throughout the year and the demands will be just less crazy at the beginning of the year and for Patrick the beginning of the year or I should say the off season for Patrick is like August to maybe September it's really not very long because he does he loves to do road so you know consistently in the last three years um it's only been like four weeks um and so big picture for Pat is that in that off season I just try like the first four weeks it's like you do you you do your thing you like I have no control over it and I think that's an, that's something that I learned as an athlete that um I like I didn't want to hear from my coach after the games, I wanted to do what I wanted to do to have fun. Mm. Um, that was a huge, like, that was super important for me. So for Pat, it's like, there's four weeks of like non-discussion. And then after that, it, it's just like, just general fitness. And then after that, it's, it's like building up capacity again so that we can start to focus on like specific so for Patrick it's actually simpler than than we think because he's got such a good baseline fitness mm -hmm. and he's got such a good baseline um like his body over the last six seven years like we've worked up a really good bulletproof style body and his focus is a little bit more on rehab prehab stuff in the off season for athletes that are like a little bit more beginner but still elite level um, the four weeks still apply postseason, but then I'll structure it in a way where it's like the base of the pyramid is just increasing aerobic work capacity and increasing, um, like, and keep in mind, I'm not a trainer by trade, so to speak. The beginning of the season for, let's say I'll take an athlete like Freya, we'll be building aerobic capacity and, um, like just baseline joint health and, and getting the joints ready for a lot of volume and then we go into baseline strength which is really just kind of exposing the athletes back into weightlifting starting with the slow lifts and then slowly moving on to the dynamic lifts always doing gymnastics in like strict at that point and then we just really kind of move on into a very traditionally traditional like crossfit training so um I inspire myself a lot by conjugate because I'm not a huge, huge fan personally of having like crazy cycles, like of excluding certain things and doing only certain things. And then, so, so after that baseline stuff where we just kind of address uh, muscular weaknesses, increasing the body's capacity to take. So like really it's shit ton of accessories at, at first. And then we kind of dive almost right into it. And, and um, the rest of the year is very similar. We use conjugate system in terms of all have high vol. They they do high intensity dynamic stuff, and I do a little bit more like endurance style, where I'll do high volume, low intensity, low volume, high intensity, and kind of separate like that. And um, yeah, it's it's like it kind of just looks like that. Whereas like I know for the for the lower uh level athletes i have a head programmer that works a lot more linearly and so their macros their general year really is much more uh specific so they have um a baseline strength phase they have a after that a max strength phase and then they have a max power phase and then a power endurance phase 
and then a fitness phase, and then they comp they compete. Um, so for them, it's much more structured. It's but yeah, for, yeah. Sorry. Um, for somebody who's competitive and who's not <clears throat> yet at the elite levels, uh, say mm -hmm. quarterfinal quarterfinals to semi uh, level athlete who or say quarterfinals who wants to you know get access to the semifinals yeah from your perspective and with everything that you've learned so far how much crossfit should that person be doing year round so my personal mentality like in this is they do crossfit all year um and i've always so the beauty about crossfit is that it's an all-encompassing program right it's gpp Okay, so, and so sorry to, sorry to cut you off michelle I, i i see where you're going maybe i so i phrased my question wrong okay how, how many uh crossfit metcons specifically or how should they be doing crossfit metcons all year uh again i understand that everything that we do is crossfit when you when you, <laughs> when you define it like this so i i meet you yeah. there but let's say competition style workouts should those oh. be done all year round uh how, what's your perspective on this so what do you mean by competition style workouts are you talking about intensity or loading like intent like metabolic intensity or loading Both, or yeah. structure yeah the, the 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 typical the typical three to one go workouts you would find find in a, a one day two day three day competition those, those types of workouts uh so how often do they come to play in a in a yearly uh training um, for uh, for quarterfinal to semifinal Yeah, so in that sense, I'm going to separate this into two. So it so in the track, in the programming that we do for the athlete that you're talking about, like let's call them, I wouldn't call them semi because to me, semifinal athletes have the capacity to do CrossFit Games, but, but they don't have the talent to qualify. So okay. physically, they're almost at a CrossFit Games level, probably not talent-wise. But if we're talking open quarterfinal athletes and bottom semifinal athletes, you know, we at DecaComp do, we don't do competition style events, but we do competition style events. So competition style, so the, it's, it's con the context is like, yes, we have three, two, one, go workouts. Yes, we do that. Yes, we have 21, 59s. We have five rounds for times and stuff like that. Um, but there's always, the, it's the way we set those up in the training that will make it training. And so the, the context we give that workout and so how people should attack it, the, you know, there's a stimulus behind it. We just don't, we don't use a different formatting. So if the stimulus, like I'll take an example of a workout that I did at uh, regionals, which was five rounds, a 400 meter run. Um, well, I think it was like, like 50 GHD sit-ups and then we did like six deadlifts really really heavy we'll have workouts like that in training but the the way we'll tell athletes to do it is like okay you're gonna run you know at a pace of a uh, perceived effort of seven um you know the GHD it's rare that we put that much GHDs like like let's swap that for a toe -to bar thing so let's say it's toe -to bar Um, then we'll tell people like break this up into three. Like the goal is to increase your work capacity and these are the movements. And so then we'll opt for probably higher volume in, in training rather than like having six deadlifts. But they do it year round. It's just different. And, and so like my, so I'll take Pat, for example. Pat does Metcons every single day. But there's Metcons that are not for time and there are Metcons that are 100% for time. In fact, they should be like almost competition uh, uh, speed. Mm -hmm. The only time they don't do the competition speed stuff is really very early on in the year. But even that, I'll do it. I'll just use different, like like I'll use, I'll, I'll use them more as a conditioning piece on a machine. And so like to answer your question, like not all the time, but all the time. Yeah, it's a, oh. I think it's a great, you, you answered perfectly. I think it's a great answer. Um, yeah. one, one thing that I see in, in athletes who uh, I'm lucky to work with who want to get access to those, those higher levels, sometimes one of the things that, that is holding them back is that they want to test themselves consistently all the time. So you talked about, you know, 
essentially training versus testing is the difference that I get here is when you, when you go out on a, on a, it could be three, two, one go, but if you have specific, uh, you know, intensities perceived ready to perceive exertions that you want to hit, those are, those are training. Those are not testing, uh, testing yourself yeah, directly. 100%. Um, so if you had any advice for someone who feels like they need to test themselves multiple times a week year round in order to get better at the sport, what would you say? Go see a therapist. <laughs> Um, if you have that need, there's something that underlyingly from experience personality wise, there's something that needs to be talked through. There's some things way bigger than just hitting that intensity. Um, like, so uh, a class member that hits that intensity all the time is just someone that doesn't know how to pace, right? Like, because there's no context of competition. But in the context of competition, if someone is is hitting the workouts and has a negative outlook and constantly needs that for reassurance, that's a problem. And that's not like that's not a programming problem because honestly, that person will probably do that even if I tell them to go slowly. And and it could be a cultural problem. It could be the perceived idea of what CrossFit's about. That 100% could be just like education. Like, hey, man, like when Freya started working with me, she had this idea of what training for the games was going to be like. And this is a conversation we had. And she was like, oh, my God, it's like not the same. It's like I'll spend three hours working on strength and accessories and I'll do a 20 minute Metcon and that's it, you know. And so her perception of, of training for the CrossFit Games was like Metcon, Metcon, Metcon. But that's not the case. Um, now, if it's like if athletes are just like, like there are other things that can tell me as a coach that if that athlete is constantly needing to test and compare all the time, like to me, that's, that's a sign that's like, okay, this athlete needs um, something more than just context. Right. And, and I want to take it to the level of like that person has problems kind of thing, but there needs to be a discussion about why, why you need to have that test. What is it about that test that makes you feel like you're in on the right path, you know, and you ask the why question enough and you'll get the answer. And another thing is also experience. Like when I started CrossFitting, this is thankfully I've had that experience. Like when I started CrossFitting, I was like that, like everything was for time. And it was like always a competition because it just like, man, it feels so good when you're done that. And then eventually you just kind of self-regulate. And so at the beginning stages, as a coach, you have to recognize like, is this going to self-regulate or is this something that's like in the character of the person and there needs to be further discussion. And I kind of tend to, to most of the time it will self-regulate. Most of the time people have a good head on their shoulders and, and they're good people and they want to do well. And that's what they think they have to do. But, you know, it, it, like when I started the, so in a couple of years ago, like two, three years ago, when I started doing endurance sports, like uh, I started doing triathlon and running and I started to read about it and start to, to, to kind of get exposed to it. I started doing workouts, not for time. And at the time I worked with Ellie and she, she struggled with those a lot. She's like, like, I, I realized now she told me, I realized now that I was actually doing it for time, even though it said not for time. And then it ended up self-regulating because my not for time workouts are workouts that are hundred to 200 reps of each movement. So it's like, at one point you're going to hit a wall. And I expect that. And so now that, you know, people have gone through this process, they get it, they understand. So it's like, yeah, go see a therapist. <laughs> if you need that kind of thing in your life constantly, and if you need to hurt yourself like that, to feel like you're going somewhere, that that um, I think your idea of what training, like you, you, you need to kind of have, it, you get education on what training means and uh, it, like who you are, you know? What's happening? How do you help someone who has difficulty with, you talked about, you know, RP7. For some people, it's just an easy thing to do. You just know what that feels like. Um, I do talk to, to some athletes that tell me, but uh, I don't know, RP, that's not my thing. Like, I don't know how to listen to myself. How important is uh, knowing how to listen to yourself as an athlete and, and pacing yourself uh, given certain constraints? Well, it's super important. Um, if you're gonna go at if you're gonna go at this competition, you have to understand what paces feel like in CrossFit. We don't have the luxury of having 
a watch that says, okay, you're on a three second per rep pace. Keep going. You're doing great. We don't have that luxury. So I, you know, I think that's a very good question and a very important conversation to have. And you have to go, you have to have experience. You have to expose yourself to making mistakes. And so that's the beauty about doing these competitions, especially two, three day competitions, because you'll be exposed to workouts that are longer than 10, 12 minutes. Um, this is so, it's so tough because most of the online stuff and most of the competitions that are readily available, even to a certain extent, competitions like Wadapalooza, they have so much involved that's not testing all the modalities. They have so, they have such a tight schedule that they have no choice but to stick to certain timeframes for workouts. And so you have to, like, as a coach, sometimes you'll need to kind of expose your athletes to a 20, 30, 40 minute workout, like a five rounds for time. And you look at the workout, you're like, shit, that's a 40 minute workout, five rounds for time, 40 minutes. You have to do that. And people have to understand what that feels like. And the more you get exposed, and this is why CrossFit to me is always what I come back to when I program, because it's about exposing yourself to different things. And sometimes you have to over-program workouts to, pro, to expose your athletes to different things. Now, in the more practical sense, you have to understand as an athlete what you're strong at and why. So if I'm really strong at couplets, um, then I have to understand why and what movements. And so I need to, like, over the time, I have to understand, like, yeah, I'm actually pretty good at squatting movements paired with pulling movements, you know? My, my seconds per rep is usually around 2.5, which is elite level for those maybe not the pull-ups, but let's say I always use the burpee and bar facing burpee and thruster as like my, my go-to. If you're at a 2.5 seconds per rep in anything that's between 45 and 60 reps in those, in those two movements, you're at an elite level pace. And if you can do that consistently, you're at an elite level pace there. And so the more you do those, the more you understand that. Um, but you have to you have to regulate for long workouts and you have to understand what it means. So that's that means sometimes when you're done doing like a 25 minute workout with a triplet and you have movements that you can kind of understand what that looks like for per second, you'll get it. You'll get your pace like like uh, it's always oh, like, oh, this is a three second per rep pace. That's what that feels like. I actually felt really good in that. And if you're like, oh, I felt like garbage the first half and you you calculate your average seconds per rep and you're like at a 2.7 seconds per rep in a 20 minute workout and you feel like fucking garbage, like you can't recover from that. You're like, okay, that's too fast. So th it requires a little bit more work on the, on the part of the athlete to understand. But as a coach, you just have to, not, like you have to kind of, you, you have to write workouts that you're like, yeah, this is a lot. So that athletes get it. They know what the spectrum is. Um, and so creativity is a big thing for that. And I guess the perception side of things, including that in, in your prescription also in, involves the athlete or, or the client more because now they have to pay attention to what's going on on the inside. They 100%. can't just put pedal to the metal and then hope for the best. A hundred percent. And athletes have to be good at recognizing like um, when I was an athlete, when I started um, and I didn't get a grasp on what my body is like, tightnesses were and stuff like that my back would flare up like I would call it the glow stick effect when my back erector is just like like all of a sudden I was like shit I can barely bend over so it's like at one point you crack the glow stick and then it glows and you're like holy shit I'm I'm done I used to ha have that a lot and I found out that when I had a hinging movement and a squatting movement at high uh without something in between to give me a break my back would would glow like it would it would just like seize up on me so when I figured that out I was like okay now I know how to and that just said how do you say in English like it it made me responsible for my progress and the same goes for paces you know the same goes for paces that said like you know a good programmer will like the the Metcon is just one piece of the puzzle because at one point you'll sustain your reps for a second better when you work more aerobically and also on your speed cycling. So it all comes together eventually. So it's not like it's, the answer isn't just exposing your athletes to Metcons of all kinds. You have to, you have to work 
other ways so that it complements the Metcon. But but the Metcon is a super important part of what we do. Um, as much as I do understand why certain people will kind of forego the Metcon because they have this idea that Metcons are high intensity, but they don't have to be. Um, the um, the importance of the Metcon is that one, it's a fun component of our sport. Like our sport is hard. We always have to work on weaknesses and we're, we're training really hard. So the Metcon is why most people get into CrossFit mm -hmm. and you have to give that to your athletes. Otherwise they're going to, you won't dig like they're going to, they're going to, they're going to lose interest and they're going to be like, well, fuck. So there's a, a component of their training that has to be giving them what they like to do, you know? And then, yeah, so the Metcon to me is a super important part and being creative with those Metcons is also super important so that the athlete understands what it feels like to go long and slow and what it feels like to go super fast and how they put those two pieces together. We touched on longevity of the CrossFit athlete at the beginning of the, the conversation. And it seems like we're now getting into a phase with all the, the youngsters coming up in the sport that, like you said, started in the sport. We're getting to the same situation as we have seen in many different sports in the past, which is that usually if you peak at a very young age in your sport, um, unless, you know, specific cases like gymnastics for, for, for girls or women, uh, because this is usually when they're going to perform better. But essentially, if you over specialize when you're young, your ceiling of performance is going to be lower than someone who had a broader base at the start, different uh, and varied sport experiences, and then built up to uh, yeah. performance in another sport. Uh, do you see that potentially being an issue in the future if people um, essentially start in CrossFit and do only CrossFit? Or do you think that there's enough variety within the sport itself as it is uh, coached and practiced now to ensure longevity of these athletes? Uh, I think the answer to your question is mostly reliant on the person helping that athlete. Um, I, I don't think, I think CrossFit has enough variety to kind of allow for longevity, but the problem is patience. And um, like, having young athletes at the CrossFit Games, to me, you know, I've never really said this publicly, but I'm not a huge fan of that. I think it gives athletes a false sense of professionalism. And it's not to say that they shouldn't be proud of what they're doing, but there is a hurry to get to the CrossFit Games after that, because you've been exposed to the top professional level of the sport. And so my concern is more about you know, if CrossFit is done well, because we forget like CrossFit started as a training and it became a sport after, mm -hmm. but if CrossFit is done well, yeah, constantly learn new things and whatever. And so if you, it, it, like if athletes are only in the gym, then yeah, I think it could be a mental problem. I think that we're going to see more burnout than anything. We're going to see people with potential kind of being like, I don't want to do this anymore. This is too much. Um, and that's fine. That's like, again, self-regulation, like maybe you weren't meant to do this and that's totally, that's totally great. Um, so my concern is about getting the athletes, uh, progressing slowly, like, and a lot of people don't have the patience for that. They don't. And the, the CrossFit is not like a, like Olympic weightlifting, like Olympic weightlifting, usually people are very careful with progressing, right? They're going to be like, it's very, very limited by percentages. And there's a very, very structured way of getting athletes to a certain place. And some, some do it super well, some don't, you know, it's like any sport, like um, some, when you, it's, it's such, dip, it's so difficult when you see an athlete with potential, all you want to do is help them reach their potential as quickly as you can, because it's like, who would say no to success, mm -hmm. right? And then the uh, the coaches that are good at seeing long term um, will do well at progressing those athletes. But will the athletes be patient enough to to go long term? And as we all know, when we're a 12, 13 year old, our brains haven't actually developed enough for us to actually see long term. And that is legit why young teens do drugs and and drink and they don't see long term and and it's just the way our brain is developed so you know it's such a tough conversation to have and i can see coaches losing athletes because they progress them a little bit slower 
Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it is very tough. It is very tough. And the, and, and I personally don't work with young athletes because I don't feel like I can do a good job with them from a distance. Um, I don't think that it's, it's doable for me working from home, programming, whatever to, to, to progress these athletes properly. And then there's the whole component, especially for young female athletes of, uh, eating disorders. I say, especially for young athletes, female athletes, but the reality is, is that it's a male female problem, but the whole discussion around the body of a CrossFit athlete. And we have to talk about that because that is on every single athlete's minds or we'll maybe not every single, we'll most athletes. Mind. So the idea of what a CrossFit athlete looks like um, and the way they perform gives a false idea of what we should be looking like and how we should perform. And so, you know, young female and male athletes minds are thinking about that. I had a conversation with an athlete, a male athlete that's like 17 or 18 years old. And he is restricting his diet because he wants to be lean, but he also wants to go to the CrossFit games. And it, it starts that young. So that is a huge, huge factor in younger athletes, more so than in older athletes, like 30 something year olds tend to have a little bit more confidence in how they look like and what they can do. Uh, but that is a huge component of young athletes so that's also something that you need to navigate and so for me like this is why most of the time athletes under 20 is something that I try not to get involved with because I don't know what they like I can't see them I don't know what they're doing what they're thinking how they're living um so I I, I think it's the coaches on site's job to make sure that they're okay and they're doing the sport for the right reasons and so yeah it's a it's a big, big question because the younger the athlete is, the, sometimes the less mature they're thinking about what it is. And and I'm guilty of this. Like when I started CrossFit, in I started CrossFit competitively at 24. And um, when I went to my first CrossFit Games, people don't think I was at the game in 2011 because I looked so different. So I was a nervous eater and I was going through some hard times. So I, I went to the CrossFit Games and I weighed 70 kilos. I'm five foot one. That's really heavy. Um, and it wasn't all muscle. So I came to the games, super puffy, unhealthy, inflamed, overeating, um, because I was stressed, but also under eating because I was like, I had a mild kind of like eating disorder, so to speak. I don't call it an eating disorder because it's, it's to me, it's the, it wasn't like sickly, but then I went to the games and I was told by my coach, that I knew that I needed to lose weight because I was like, yeah, I don't look like all the other girls. And I know that I'm having a problem with that right now with my life outside of the gym. And I need to get that sorted. And I also need to lean out a little bit. And then my coach said, you know, you'd be surprised how little athletes actually need to eat. And so that started uh, me literally eating like a freaking idiot and eating nothing. And I didn't realize it, but I had an eating disorder. I was eating a cup of spinach, two eggs, chicken for, for lunch and a salad. And then dinner was meat and veggies. And this is like during the paleo kind of thing. Like back then we were all paleo and all that shit. And I lost 25 pounds in one year. Mm. I was losing my hair. I was super irritable. Like I was the worst person to be around. And because I had this idea in my head that CrossFit Games athletes have to have a six pack, you had to be vascular and you had to be stri a stri like a, you had to have striation. That was a CrossFit Games athlete. And then when I went to the games in 2012 that year, I performed like absolute garbage. So then I realized, okay, now I need to actually like take this as a professional because, because I have, I need help from professionals to do this. And so lucky for me, I didn't fall into a really big problem, although it was a problem for a certain amount of time. And so younger athletes to me are very fragile to that. Not all of them, but a lot of them. And so we have to talk about the idea of what a games athlete looks like. So yeah, I'm gonna stop talking about this, right? <laughs> well, I'm gonna, we're gonna continue talking about this, but this answer is long-winded. <laughs> It's a, it's, you're obviously very passionate about this topic and rightly so. I think 
it, it is important because you know people that look up to games athletes and want to compete at the highest level in the sport again they they're going to try to emulate try to look like try to be like those people yeah. uh but as you as you rightly said eating a sufficient amount and often a considerable amount given the nature of the sport and how much training you have to do and the fact that you need to build more infrastructure aka muscle over time because this is yeah. literally th w which is going to do the work that you're trying to perform and if you yeah. consistently underfeed yourself you're not going to have that infrastructure you're not going to have that cellular repair you're not going to have that recovery yeah. that is absolutely paramount to to if you want to be if you want to even get close to having a chance of being one of the best in the sport. Yeah. And the biggest concern I have is that the social media aspect of CrossFit, it's so good because it's visually stunning. Like how cool is it when you look at your CrossFit feed and you see like women with eight packs because before women were like, women like that weren't a thing. So there's some beautiful things about it. And there's some things that are very positive. Like when we see how women's athletes have changed over the years outside of CrossFit, thanks to CrossFit, because now there is, I, I think it's safe to say that there is a much more acceptable, um, it's much more acceptable being a woman, being a female with some level of physical athletic look. It's more, it's way more accepted than it used to be. Mm. Um, but that comes at a detriment because it, it like, you can get the, this, the, the, sickening side of it where it's like the, the, this body composition is just as unattainable for most people than being super skinny. Um, we don't, we forget that. Like there is a very genetic component to how a lot of people look. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and sometimes there's an unnatural component at how other people look. And we don't think about that. Like there's some, you know, some athletes out there and I don't want to say that I think CrossFit isn't not doped. I think a lot of athletes do take, um, performance enhancing drugs that turn out like that have physical effects, like body composition effects, no more than another sport does, but we forget about that. And, um, it's, it's, it's so hard. And even today we, like, I see sometimes I follow some female games athletes that talk about body dysmorphia and the way they see themselves, like some athletes that people would kill to have their body that are that are publicly saying like i'm uncomfortable in my body so that's how crazy this problem is and not a lot of people talk about it in crossfit like the, it's it's a big problem and i think you know when you say that at the beginning of our conversation you said well in the middle of our conversation you said that some athletes think that they need to test themselves a lot to see that they have progress and then i'd say some athletes and that limits their potential. And then a lot of athletes are potentials are limited by how they think they should be looking when they do CrossFit. Mm. You know, I think it's, it's a big problem. So the, if the more we talk about it, the better. And I think, I think like I've, I've coached a lot of female athletes and almost all of them had had eating disorders, almost all of them. I would argue that all of them did the ones that I've worked with one-on-one. -on -one. That's how big this problem is. So yeah. How do we fix that? Like, I think coaches have a big role on educating and, mm. and, um, talking to the athletes about proper nutrition, but then sometimes you have to be careful with who you speak to about nutrition. I've seen an athlete in my career that has had an eating disorder, like a, like a dangerous eating disorder that had lost, like that had had a, you say that like a remission of that eating disorder. And then the coach had a one size fits all approach to nutrition and talked about counting macros. And the second that happened, that athlete went back into mm. her, her problem. So we really need to be careful with how we talk about this problem. And so one of the questions I have with a lot of the athletes that I start working with is, have you had an eating disorder? Um, and so more people need to ask that question and need to do it in a safe way. And, you know, and, now we're seeing other people talk with athletes. So aside from coaches, we're seeing athletes have an entourage, like an agent, this and that. And there are, you know, nutritional companies that are sponsoring athletes. And so that also needs to be, and usually nutritional companies will are very, like they're super aware of this problem. Um, but sometimes agents and other, other uh, entourage 
aren't. They're trying to do the best thing for them, but they haven't been maybe been exposed to the problem of sport performance and eating disorders. So the more we talk about it, the more people are aware about it, the more people will be careful about how they speak to the athletes about nutrition because it had it's it's a conversation you can't avoid. But like, you know, when 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 I'm told that athletes have had eating disorders right away, it's like, okay, well, um, other questions, it's like, do you know what triggers it? Do you know what like do you are do you are you seeing someone about it? Like how recent is it? You know, asking important questions and then when you knowing your limits, you know, I'm not going to tell them how to eat. I, I don't have any education in that. I don't have any, like the only thing I can say is from experience, you know, I've had a year where I've learned that, you know, I had one year where I had an eating disorder and then I paid for that one year for like probably two years, I'd say until my body started to kind of like be okay and like normal and, and pack on fat the way it should and, and stuff like that it takes time. So luckily for me, I kind of, I was exposed to it to a certain degree, but I, I don't have the same experience as some other athletes, you know? As you said, I think as a coach, it's important to know what your strengths are and where your blind spots are as well. Pers yeah. Personally, I don't talk about my, I don't talk about nutrition to my athletes simply because I am not trained. My my wife is a nutritionist. She is an instructor for nutritionists. So I've, I've, I've heard, I've read the books, I've heard all the conversations, but it's still not my field. And even though I, I, I understand a lot of things, I don't know a lot of things, and I, I would never be in a place to say you should do that or this is the right thing. Yes, of course. Because yeah. as you said, it has to be individual, highly individualized. Uh, because even across time, somebody's microbiome can change. Uh, you know, people's uh, sensitivities can evolve and change, uh -huh. and all those things have to be considered. So I, I really like that you're emphasizing this because. It is because uh, at the end of the day, we're, we're talking about sports, we're talking about performance. But when we talk to nutrition and uh, eating disorders, we're talking about health. And we're talking about things that can have a long term negative effect on on someone's health. And this should be the, the, the farthest thing away from what we're trying to do as coaches, regardless of what performance we're trying to attain. It cannot be at the detriment of long term health for our athletes. A hundred percent. And then. At one point, look, we're talking, we want our athletes to be healthy, um, but there are moments that they won't be. And that's yeah. part of sport. That's part of yeah. performance too. Like my last year, I was like, I was sponsored by naproxen. Like I, I, I was on so many anti-inflammatories and it was a risk that, you know, I, I, I knew that it wasn't good for me, but it would get me through what I needed to get through. And then sometimes like that's part of it too. And see, like this, this, sometimes it's health is not like it's short term, but I agree with you when it comes to performance and, and health. And, and to me, nutrition has a lot to do with mental health. That's a huge component in, in that's why I'd like, we have to have a human approach. There are some people that'll be more fragile to mental health. And we all know that mental health can translate into physical symptoms. And so health is so, it's so big. You know, I had athletes that when they got really nervous before a competition, they would always get a cold and really sick. So at first I was like, that has to be physical. I'm probably pushing him way too far. You know, he's probably being, and then he's, and, and we know that coaches know that like when you're training at a, you're getting close to that super peak, like athletes are, are probably going to get like upper respiratory infections, like little things like that. But when it's consistently before a competition, like all the time, then you're like, ah, maybe there's a mental component to this. There's like, there's like, you're like mentally, you're just so fatigued, you know? So it's, it's so big. Health is so big. There's so many little things that you have to kind of think about and just be, you don't have to know, you just have to be aware of, you know? Mm -hmm. And another point that I feel is important and, and a question that was actually asked on uh, on the, uh, the little story I put up on Instagram in preparation for the podcast is talking about the menstrual cycle for women and performance uh -huh. and health. Um, is that a topic I imagine that you talk about as well with your female athletes? Uh, if so, <laughs> one of the important things to do to, to talk about, I mean, you have the advantage to be a woman. Uh, and so you, you know how it works. Um, a lot of male coaches aren't educated on the, on the question. Yeah. And if you're, if you're a male coach working with uh, a female athlete, at some point, this is a conversation that has to be had, or at least, like you said, an awareness that needs to exist because it is an important component of 
um, simply the, the the woman's daily life, the the, the somebody's yeah. daily life, and also how they're going to perform, how they're going to recover. And uh, so talk, talk, talk to us a little bit about this. Important yeah, topic as well. um, it's funny because, yes, I am a woman. I get my period, but I'm not super well educated in the actual effects of that hormonal mm -hmm. cycle. All I know is that I knew that the week before I got my period and I, I don't track. So I never tracked my period like I, I never did. I knew when it was coming based on how I was feeling. I'm like, oh, I'm feeling a little crampy and I'm like the weights are heavy. I'm like, oh, yeah. I'm getting my period probably in a couple of days. And then some women have like very little symptoms and very little changes. The, the, the shitty part about being a female athlete is that sometimes you get your period when you're competing and there's nothing you can do about it. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, I, so I've seen a lot of talk about this and it's like considered taboo. Personally, I, I've, I've never considered it taboo. I've never had an issue with talking to my coaches about my period. Um, but when like, I've had athletes that didn't have them. And so one of the things that I did realize that was really important is that, and this is kind of by fluke. So when I started doing the 80, 20 stuff with my programming, mm -hmm. doing a lot more low intensity stuff and a lot and dosing the high intensity stuff, one of my athletes that didn't have her period for a long time actually started getting it again. And she didn't have her period for a very long time because it just so happened that she had like um, an eating disorder when she was very young. And so that affected a lot her hormonal development. Um, but then, so when I found out about that, um, I was like, okay, this is really interesting so that we can, we can reduce the effects of the stress of training on a female's body and her hormonal um, uh, situation. And whether that comes from the fact that when we do high volume work, athletes are more hungry, um, or if it's like they can eat a little bit better because higher intensity days are shorter volume and they can actually get more food in during the day. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's, maybe that's what it is, or maybe it's the actual stress response to doing low, like, I don't know what it is. Um, but it's an, it's, it's, talking about it is important because it allows you to see like oh shit okay there's some really interesting things about this and then you start to do it with other people and it's like oh it worked or it didn't um i personally have gone through a moment where i lost my period and i realized the importance of nutrition on the period like instantly you know you're kind of told that some women like i like i said when i did crossfit i never really lost my period except for i think once uh when i was competing for the games and I had lost all that weight. I, I really like you, you realize after two, three months, you're like, oh shit, I didn't get my period. And now I got it. Like, oh my God, I didn't even realize it. Um, but when I was competing after I did CrossFit, I retired and I went into competing in weightlifting. And now we're talking weight class. And so for, in order for me to get carded and to get the elite status in Quebec, I had to compete in the 50, uh, the 58 category, which is now the 59, but Back then it was a 58. So I went from like 61, 62 to 58. And I did it in a way, actually, I had what I thought was a good nutritionist. And he's like, you have to eat high carb, no fat, like normal protein. And so I did that, instantly lost my period. Mm. And and this is that to me was really stressful because back then I was I was trying to have kids and I was like, shit. Like, what am I going to do? <laughs> so having gone through that, um, I have a better understanding of, of like the direct role of nutrition. Sometimes we're like, oh, whatever, you know, whatever, that's fine. It's like, I'm different, you know, but actually there's a direct role in it. So I have the advantage of being a woman because I know, like, I know what it's like to lose the period. I know what it's like when you get your period. I know that the days, like everyone's different. So personally, when I got my period the first day, I was like useless. I couldn't do anything. I was tired. I had cramps. Like I just, I was sluggish. So when I went into the gym, I just did what I could. And then I moved on. Um, but I was also older. So I wasn't putting that much pressure on myself. Younger athletes may find themselves really putting pressure on themselves to get the work done. And so when I ask my, when I'm talking to athletes and then it comes up that you like, oh yeah, I'm getting my period soon. It's like, oh, okay, man, just do you know, just do the aerobic stuff and just, and then forget the waste. We'll do that tomorrow. We'll, yeah, and check, the, check the, the effects are very, yeah, the effects are very short. Like for some women, it's 48 hours. For some, it's 24. Um, for some, it's longer. So although 
we have to talk about period periods and, and menstrual cycles for women, but it's not an, it like male, male coaches out there. It's not like, not all women have the same symptoms. Yeah, Some don't, but, but they, but they all, they all have a cycle and we have to yeah. be aware of, of that fact. And again, like you said, every person is going to experience it differently. So yes. we, we need to have a minimum of conversation, especially if there's going to be a, a an interaction or an effect of, of, from the cycle to, to the training. Um, one thing that yeah. you, you said was, that was really interesting. You talked about the 80, 20 distribution. Um, and, and I think you were right on the food and, uh, I think the stimulus as well from a nervous system standpoint probably plays some role oh, yeah. when we do stay, you know, at low intensities, we have a, a dominance from the parasympathetic side, which is going to be very helpful for people that spend their time on the sympathetic end all day long. Uh, so that's, that's very interesting that you, that you notice that when you essentially just distributed the intensity and the volume differently, right? Yeah. So like I said, I, I started doing that when I started doing, like I started reading up a lot about running training. And so what I found interesting, so to me, CrossFit is an endurance sport. It's a power endurance sport. That's the way I see it. It's much more reliant on the endurance component than the um, anaerobic and the high, like, like seven second snatch thing. Like, like that doesn't exist anymore. It used to, when we look at the sport and the history of the sport, the athletes that performed really well at the beginning of the sport were those who can hit high intensity consistently mm -hmm. and there was only like six events maybe and so they had a lot of success you didn't need a whole lot of endurance for that um and then as time went on especially with dave as programmer we started to see that the athletes that had the most success were the strongest and the most endurance and so sometimes those athletes are actually the same because you can be very strong and very endurance you might not be the most technically skilled mm -hmm. um and then somewhere in between that, there was a moment where high skilled athletes did really, really well. And now what we're seeing is that like with Boz, we may go back to a skill-based athlete. And so every year is a little bit different, but if you look at what we needed to do to be on the top as a CrossFit Games athlete, it changed every year. But there are years we can say like, man, if you were like a hundred and if you're a female and you weighed uh, 70 kilos or more, or like 155 pounds or more, and you were like five foot four or more, you were going to do well at the games. You know, now we can't say that anymore because we don't know, like Boz just started. So we need to see a little bit more, but like it, it changes all the time. So, but I still think that if you're going to be, especially a semifinal athlete, you have to be really good at uh, endurance and power endurance those are the components that are really to me like the things that that are really stand out and so when I started reading about 80 20 I was like well if those are the elements that we need to get the athletes good at we need to see this and train this the way endurance athletes train and specifically the way half marathoners train and stuff like that because they're actually running at a very high intensity for really like I would call it a moderate amount of time. So their training to me was really, really interesting. Triathletes as well. So I was like, well, I'll give it a shot. And one year I said to Pat, I'm like, listen, I want to try something. And I'm going to try it with you. Are you okay with it? And Pat's always been really, really cool. Like he's always been open to trying things out with him. And Pat has never done the same thing any year. I've always kind of switched it up. And I think that's part of the reason why he's, he's still getting better. Mm -hmm. And when we did the 80-20 thing, um, honestly, it's the year he got um, second um, uh, recently. So 2021, I believe, he got second. Um, and I was like, okay, this is working. This is working. He's been training so much for the last, you know, five, six years. And I found a formula that has allowed him at 31 or 32 to manage his injuries. I can't say avoid. It's it's completely unrealistic to think that someone that age would avoid injury, but we managed it. In fact, all of his lifts went up just because at the beginning of the year, I had him doing three high volume, low intensity days and two low volume, high intensity days. And within that, I went with a conjugate style of uh, changing up modalities. So the high intensity days, one week was gymnastics. 
low intensity was weightlifting, and then I would switch it up. And then all throughout that, the components of the Metcons just followed the high volume, low, low volume thing. Mm -hmm. And they were designed to complement whatever like accessory component we were training and, and huge success. So I was like, okay. And then on top of that, I was working with Ellie that year and huge success for her because she actually um, just understood what it was like to train lower intensity. And so she was able to manage her efforts throughout the year a little bit more. She put a lot less pressure on herself um, when she was competing and when she was training. Um, Ellie was the kind of athlete that put a lot of pressure on herself. She wanted to do really well. So every day was like, really important and so the high volume days it was just about getting the work done so her mindset shift and so just it was a success for her just to navigate training and she went from being a non-games athlete to a games athlete so it was it was like there was a lot of really good things about that system and throughout the years I've kind of always wondered why I didn't have a style and then so I realized okay well this this seems to be working for the athletes and it's such a flexible way of programming that depending on the athletes that I have, it works out well. What I did find out though, is that for the less experienced athletes, it wasn't the best. Um, there was a big component of confidence that was just like not there. And, and so with Freya, I realized that she hadn't had that many years training behind her belt that when I was giving her low intensity, high volume stuff, she didn't have the confidence it would help her and so like I found that there was a lot of hesitation when it came to doing higher intensity things so yeah I don't know I don't know like it's, you when you try things out you start to learn different things and that 80 20 stuff had like it's not fully 80 20 because we don't like it's not fully controllable like that but the, it, the idea, right? It's it's the overall yes. idea of we are going How, to spend most of our time here, and then when the time is right, we're just going to put the hammer down on on that exactly. specific day or that specific yes. modality, and make sure that essentially we 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 only spend our fatigue coins or tokens on on those key workouts that we want to really where we really want to push. And the yeah. other ones, we're doing low enough so that we don't spend any or very few and we have more for the big days to come. Exactly. And at first, the way I structured it is the high volume days were at the beginning of the week and then we would creep up into intensity because that's how competition works. Mm -hmm. When we talk about CrossFit Games, that's how it works. We do high volume stuff and we finish with high intensity stuff. CrossFit Games is always like that. But then I realized that uh, recovery was a big problem. So I would, now I'm switching it up. So the high volume stuff is before rest day. High intensity stuff is first. So you have to like, you have to be very flexible, like coaches out there, be flexible, be really flexible with how you do things and try things out. Don't be afraid to try things out. Um, I'm kind of like answering a question you didn't ask, but. <laughs> I love it. I love it, yeah. Michelle. Uh, I have one last question for you. I've been holding you for, for quite a while here. Um, <laughs> What are you looking forward to the most about this upcoming CrossFit season? Oh, that's a really good question. My, what I'm looking forward to the most is seeing what Boz comes up with at the games this year. And if, if I, so I don't know Boz very well, um, but if I size him up well, I think he's going to throw us up for another loop. And I think he's going to avoid my anticipation of that he's going to avoid having a style the way Dave did. So I'm excited to see that. I'm also excited to see Freya compete. Those are the two big things because Freya is like so new. Freya's only Freya's third competition in her whole career was the CrossFit Games. <laughs> this, is, this, is, <laughs> this is pretty crazy. <laughs> yeah, it is pretty crazy. So she's doing Dubai next week, which yeah. we'll see how it goes. She hasn't been feeling super great lately, but like, We'll see how Dubai goes, but like, yeah, I'm excited to see her compete. Michelle, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the podcast. It was uh, a real, real pleasure to, to chat with you again, uh, to chat with you today. And I hope we'll get to, to do it again. Yeah, Sean, thank you so much. I had a great time. Well, before I let you go, where can people find out uh, more about what you do? Um, so myself personally on Instagram, it's at M-I-C-H underscore Le Tendre, L-E-T-E-N-D-R-E. And then um, uh, programming-wise, coaching-wise, it's at DECACOMP. So D-E-K-A-C-O-M-P. Um, yeah, check us out. Um, I mean, we, we're a small team, but uh, we love what we do. So if you guys like to try 
things that are just, you know, slightly different, but very CrossFit and that comp is, is good. Links in the description for everybody watching and listening. Thanks again so much. And uh, I'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much, Sean. Thanks for listening to this episode. If you would like to support the podcast, please take a few moments to leave a written review and a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts. If you want to watch this episode again, you can find the full video recording on my YouTube channel. You'll also find hundreds of hours of free content, all my podcasts, my thoughts of the day, structured presentations, and more. So don't wait, go subscribe, and I'll see you in the next episode. Take care.